Matt, you represent many of the men and women who responded to the Grenfell fire. What do you make of the report and what do you make of its findings? I think we, um, we uh, concern we've set, set out from the start is the ordering of the inquiry. That's the focus is entirely on the response that night and clearly that needs to be examined. But before any firefighter turned out from North Kensington Fire Station, before the first 999 call, the building had already been turned effectively into a death trap. That's all the fire safety provisions within the building had been compromised. So the fire they faced was unprecedented in the UK. I'll come on to foreseeability in a moment. Uh, and we don't think you can really assess that without looking at how it was put into that state. What decisions, what's the regulatory regime, what's the inspection regime, who, who agreed the contracts, all of those issues that actually created the situation whereby that fire spread in such a way. Uh, that said, in terms of the recommendations, we are broadly supportive of the recommendations. Our criticism would be that they are, some of them are directed at the London Fire Brigade. We think they should be national, that they apply to, okay. that these buildings are all over the country, so it shouldn't just apply to the London Fire Brigade. Where we uh, have some concern is around the narrative around uh, decision making on the night, particularly around some of the issues you've touched on, um, because for us, the. Um, to deal with emergency situations in a life and death situation, you need to have planned for it. And the truth is, and I think there are questions to be answered about why it wasn't planned for, but the truth, it wasn't planned for. And to expect people on the night to change long-standing policies that they've been trained for, on the, which are national policies, some on a quite junior level, I mean, quite junior levels in the London Fire Brigade to make those decisions, I, I struggle to see how that could have actually happened. Mm. And I think the... Second area where we have some concerns is, is the assertion, because I, I don't think there is clear evidence in the report, that actually had other decisions been made, the outcome would have been significantly different. Uh, that, that second one, I, I, I was sort of expecting the first answer. The second one I find a bit more yeah. surprising, because I suppose most people, and I, I think this is what the resident groups are saying as well, is that the stay put advice, which is based on the idea that a fire wouldn't spread from one flat to the other, yes. which quite rightly, you know, you're saying, that was the expectation and it was because this flammable cladding was placed on the building that those expectations were no longer you know, fulfilled mm -hmm. by the way that the fire behaved. But I, I thought there was general consensus that the stay put advice that had been given by the fire brigade did cause more death. So, so regardless of whose fault it was that that stay put advice was given, yep. that was a mistake, no? I, I, take, I take, understand the point, but I think the, the conclusions that the report reached aren't actually based on evidence that he sets out so the they well, there were various expert witnesses who gave uh, evidence at, to the inquiry including uh, professor barbara lane who gave evidence and her window of opportunity for evacuation for example is runs from 126 until 140 uh, that's the most clear case that is made um, for an evacuation opportunity the inquiry concludes that that window is from 1.30 until 1.50. So for some reason they move from what their own expert witness has said to, first of all, to extend from 14 minutes to 20 minutes, mm. and it's a different time period. Um, the other expert witness who gave advice on evacuation gave a, a, a serious proviso, and that is that it would have relied on a system of common fire alarms, i.e. A, a, me a method by which the residents could have been alerted, and that didn't exist. There was no fire alarm system in Grenfell Tower. And the point... Oh, wait, was, can I just... I know this is... Sure. There was no fire alarm system in Grenfell Tower? No. I, I don't know how that's a fact about this. Most happening. residential blocks of flats in the UK will not have common fire alarms. They, they have smoke alarms. Oh, they'll have smoke, in, they'll sorry, have smoke they'll alarms, have smoke alarms in, flats, in individual flats. But not yeah. a system by which an external body, either the fire brigade or the landlord or whoever, can alert every resident okay, yeah. to the need to evacuate. So there is no system by which uh, the flats can easily be evacuated. So there are some quite... Uh, no, our, our view is we don't know because it, it, no, no flat in those no block of flat in the UK has ever been evacuated in those circumstances. Mm. So the truth is, we're open-minded on it. We've called on the government since the fire to launch a review of that issue, to assess it, to test it, to do drills and tests. Uh, and it's a bit surprising that 28 months after the fire, that hasn't happened, and we have to wait till the inquiry report to make that recommendation that it should happen. Right, let's go on to actually government responses in a moment. I want to park that for one second. Just, sure. just in terms of this issue of, I suppose, could more lives have been saved? So I know that what, the, what Danny Cotton, <coughs> who's the LFB, 
commissioner, she was saying there was no way of, you know, planning of, about how you would evacuate these people. But I just presume that given the building was, you know, given you'd passed a certain point, it was worth the risk, right? It's just worth the risk trying to get people down instead of staying up there. Well, I suppose our, where we part company with the London Fire Brigade is on the issue of foreseeability, that we think there were warning signs, both at fires in Britain and fires elsewhere in the world, where if we had proper national structures in the fire service, which we used to have and we don't have any more, you would be horizon scanning, you'd be looking at new building design, you'd be looking at what mm. refurbishment of 1970s tower blocks means. The truth is nobody has been doing that. But most uh, obviously the Lackanell House fire in London where a number of people died and the coroner alerted authorities, including the London Fire Brigade, but also central government about the need to review stay put. So there are questions to answer around why that wasn't done at the time. But I suppose in, in defence of decision making on the night, considering people in very high positions of authority had done nothing in over several years and considering government ministers were aware of this issue and had done nothing and considering government ministers have done nothing since 2017 but to expect someone in the space of 20 minutes to make those decisions i think that that raises some quite alarming um injustice in, mm. in my view and what, what's your relationship as the general secretary of the fire brigades union to the london fire brigade i mean because presumably I imagine you represent a lot of the rank and file who are out there who are rescuing people on that night. And I think the report has been, you know, quite, you know, it, it's emphasised that the rank and file firefighters who, who turned up were incredibly brave and, you know, acted incredibly honourably. And most of the criticism has been towards people, you know, further up the ranks of the London Fire Brigade. What's, what's your relationship to the different, you know, levels of, of hierarchy in that organisation? So we're, we're one of the most highly unionised industries in the UK so in the London Fire Brigade something like 96 97 percent of the uniformed workforce will be members of ours so of the people going into Grenfell Tower almost to a person and we know the people who weren't if you like members of ours uh, however I would say we are probably the most consistent critics of fire policy in the UK including of individual fire services such as the London Fire Brigade the London Fire Brigade under you know a number of years ago under Boris Johnson's mayoralty uh, embarked on the biggest ever cuts program in any fire service in the history of the UK. We oppose that. We oppose, we've opposed the deregulation of the fire service, which we think lies behind a lot of what happened at Grenfell Tower. So we're often, we have a dialogue with chief officers and commissioners. Uh, we often have disagreements. Um, and we, there are areas on this issue where we probably share some views and there are areas where we think actually there's a fundamental breakdown in the system that needs to be addressed. Mm. I mean, in terms of this review, I know you've said that you think they've done it in the wrong order, so that they've looked at you know the fire brigade first and and what happened on the on the particular night instead of the you know the, the systemic reasons that led to that fire and the people who were implicated in in putting flammable cladding on on a sky rise building on a high rise building. It is do you think the ordering there is is there some logic to it, even though you critique it, or do you think this is you know a stitch up and that, and it's almost a bit of a conspiracy to try and scapegoat the fire brigade as opposed to people who might have more structural power in society. You can make a case why it's in that. In a way, it's, I suppose it's an easier bit of the inquiry because we're going to then move on to legislation, contracts and so on. That's a far more complicated area, possibly. Uh, my fear is, whether, considering the length of time it's taken to get to the phase one report, how long will it take to get to the phase two? So, we, we you know, people... Uh, assume present that that we're going to see major changes after phase two well that could be five or six years after mm. the fire and the idea that we have to wait five or six years for fundamental change to the fire safety policy regime in the uk is is pretty alarming i mean it's a big it's a big broad question but i mean what is your principle you know as general secretary of, of the fire brigade union as someone who was a fireman as someone who's you know who's got firefighter we say firefighter sorry who's got advanced knowledge you know, of, of these systems. What's your analysis of how Grenfell was able to happen and how it can be stopped from happening or how a similar tragedy can be stopped from happening in the future? I think it is a, a story of deregulation. People ask if it's about cuts. Cuts are a part of it, but it's far more about deregulation and uh, the scrapping of standards. So we had a fire service in the UK that was linked in to systems about building control, you know, how you build buildings, the regulations around that, the inspection of buildings, and then the fire service's role in that. And uh, from 2000, uh, well, actually 
the process started under in 1980 under Margaret Thatcher of saying that we, our regulations are too strict. We need to free up regulations to uh, and, uh, enable businesses to invest mm. and, and develop and developers and to develop. For example, as far as I understand, it used to be the fire brigade that would sign off a building to say that it was fire safe. Yeah. And now the developers like are allowed to do that. With so we their have own we have attracted self regulation system yeah. effectively. Um, and so if people think the fire service can stop things happening. The fire service has very limited powers to stop things happening. Uh, it, looking at it from just from our point of view, the fire, fire and rescue service, we used to have bodies which set national standards. Uh, so that would be how you respond. Let's just take the issue of how you respond to a, a fire in a block of flats. Today, you, and this is post-2004, today you will go to uh, a, a block of flats in London fire, and you will get uh, a response of X number of fire engines. If you go across the board into Essex, you will get a completely different standard. You go to the West, and it is a complete um, postcode lottery in that respect. So no national standards, no national standards in terms of appointment, recruitment, different policies of how you fight fires even creeping in. Uh, you, the, the bodies that we used to have, we used to have a, a, a take at the issue of Looking, horizon scanning, as I called it, you know, we, we did have a body, the Central Fire Brigade's Advisory Council, which existed from 1947 until 2004, and that looked at all these issues of standards. How do you train? How do you tra say the question of stay put, moving from stay put to evacuation? They would have assessed how do you do that, and then how do we transfer that into the real world of telling, training firefighters on the ground to do it? That doesn't exist. So every fire service is doing this in their own way. So, and a complete fragmentation of the fire and rescue. So it used to be described as a, a national service delivered locally. Now you've got a localised, fragmented service. Um, and that's part of the picture. And then you look at the fire safety regime, a, a shift towards self-regulation, self-assessment, systems where, and I'm not saying this is directly relates to Grenfell, but systems where people who are fire risk assessors can set up in business with no qualifications at all. That's the world uh, that we're living in. Has anything changed since then? What, what, what's been learned? What's, uh, have these have buildings? I'm, I'm of the understanding that there's still a lot of high-rise buildings with this flammable cladding yeah. on the outside of it and that action has been kind of disgracefully slow, I suppose. Is, is that an analysis you Yeah, you I think it's the FBU? It, it painfully slow. So there, there are, the government is looking at things like the, the building regulations and the regime around that and the... the uh, Flammable cladding, there is a programme to remove flammable cladding, or, or sorry, ACM cladding. There's different types of flammable cladding. Uh, again, painfully slow. We've got from the fire service what is called an interim policy uh, of how do you deal with these high, very high risk buildings now, knowing that Grenfell has happened. Uh, but it's an interim policy that's now been in place for two and a half years. Mm. That's not really an interim policy. Yeah. Uh, so, in our view, in terms of the fire and rescue service, nothing substantial. Uh, 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 happening uh, on on any great scale. I mean, your mem I mean, your members must be. I mean, because no, no one wants to be in a, and especially in an emergency service where they feel like they're going into an environment which is unsafe and where they're unprepared. I mean, your members must be, you know, getting really frustrated with this situation. I think they. Are, yeah, I think there's different moods. I think London members are, are, are angry, but some just had enough of Grenfell. You know, they they feel that uh, they. It, some film people the most painful night of their lives yeah. and probably don't want to talk about it. Outside of London, a huge interest in some of the, the, these themes about what's what are the different standards. If, if Grenfell had happened outside of London, the disaster would have been far, far worse because the London Fire, Fire Brigade is one of the best resourced fire brigades in the country uh, and was able to get large numbers of people there very quickly. If that had happened anywhere else, they simply would not have had the personnel to deal with it uh, in on the same scale. So Pete, our, our members are, are imagining what would have happened if this had happened here. Um, again, a frustration. I think there's a big concern, cynicism about politicians generally among a lot of our members uh, and, and not convinced that actually anything serious is going to change. Mm. Aaron, you want to come in? Or? Yeah, you said it was more of a national service previously. When, when did that sort of transition take place? The, the big change was in, uh, w there was a, a dispute between ourselves and our employers 2002-2003 under the new Labour government and I suppose my take on it would be that was used as an opportunity to make fundamental changes to fire and rescue policy and legislation. So I mentioned 
the act that created, in reality, the modern fire and rescue, fire brigades, as it was called, fire service, was the 1947 Act, set up under the post-war Labour government, in a way part of the post-war consensus and so on. That was in place from 1947 until 2004. In 2004, a whole series of new uh, legislation in the different parts of the UK, the Fire and Rescue Services Act 2004 in England, Wales, Scotland, Northern Ireland. Uh, but all those bodies, uh, was so we had an inspectorate that was scrapped at the same time, the Central Fire Brigades Advisory Council scrapped at the same time, National Appointment and Promotion Regulations scrapped at the same time, National Standards of Fire Cover scrapped at the same time. All these national standards went at a stroke uh, in either 2003, 2004 and a shift to a very localised system. So they, they, now that each fire service sets its own standards, and then measures their, the effectiveness mm. of their own standards. What was the argument for that? I mean, because that seems just utterly crazy. The argument, and this, I think, again, this lies behind uh, some of the debate around Grenfell, is there has been in the UK and in many of the advanced economies a downward trend in fires. So, you know, if you think the way we heat our homes, mm. smoking, not using chip pans, all those things have had an impact. Also, the work of the fire service in preventative activities has had an impact. So there is a, has been a downward trend. In the past three or four years, that has plateaued, and actually we've seen some increase. But then from central government, there was an endless mantra of, because the number of fires has declined, fire itself is therefore a declining risk, and therefore you should reduce the number of firefighters uh, and fire stations. And, my answer to that on a very sim simple basis is if you used to have 100 fires in a community and you now only have 80, that's great, but it doesn't to us mean that the people who have the 80 fires should have a lower standard of service. But that is the logic. It's a very supply and demand-led mm. argument that has driven these changes. And I have to say, again, where we part company with chief officers, they have gone along with this for 16, 18 years. They've helped to dismantle the structures that in our view, maintained standards. And who, <clears throat> who, who are the sort of chief engineers of that policy? Obviously, that's during the sort of later Blair years. Are there any po politicians? I mean, not, not to sort of lambast them, but just to sort of put some meat on the bone in terms of where this was coming from politically. Well, uh, this, this emerged from fire ministers at the time, Nick Rainsford uh, being the one in 2002 who started some of this debate. They then commissioned a... Uh, so-called independent review of the Fire and Rescue Service under George Bain, who was a professor of industrial relations, and much of what happened to the Fire Service emerged from that review of the right. Fire Service. The Fire and Rescue Services Act was based on Bain's review of the uh, the service, and uh, they they criticised the Fire Service as being slow to change. Um, uh, I think the big criticism of the union, very highly unionised, they think that we have slowed down change and so on. So a, a big part of that agenda was, mm. uh, was against the Fire Brigade's union.